Yeah. Well, it's happened and so far successfully. The first men to walk in space without a lifeline to their mother spaceship. Just a couple of little gas jets strapped to their backs. The first human satellites, in the words of one of the astronauts, one heck of a step for me. NASA have officially confirmed that the two astronauts have left the shuttle Challenger and they're now out there in space. We're waiting for the first pictures of this historic event from NASA and we hope to have them within a couple of minutes and we'll be going over live to Mission Control. The two men making the spacewalk are Captain Bruce McCandless, who's 46, he was the first one out, and Lieutenant Colonel Robert Stewart, who's 41. Both men are married and both are on their first space mission. They've had plenty of training for their spacewalk. They spend hours in big water tanks testing their James Bond-style backpacks or manned maneuvering units, as NASA calls them. By Friday, McCandless and Stewart and their three colleagues were fully briefed and ready to go aboard the shuttle. We've had uh, similar indications of this happening uh, on other flights. and uh... The countdown and launch went exactly as planned. Solid rocket booster ignition and liftoff of Challenger and the 10th Space Shuttle flight. And the shuttle has cleared the tower. Tower clear. Pitch program. Houston now controlling. Roll maneuver. Roll maneuver confirmed. 15 seconds. Good roll confirmed by mission control. It was a textbook liftoff from Cape Canaveral, but once Challenger was in orbit, things began to go wrong. Two communications satellites launched from the shuttle's huge cargo bay went into the wrong orbit and disappeared from radar screens. NASA have accepted that both are lost and now the insurers are counting the cost, more than a hundred million pounds. And another mishap, a balloon released from the shuttle burst as it was being inflated. It was to have provided a rendezvous point for the astronauts on the spacewalk. Well, that spacewalk has been rather more successful, and with me in the studio now is our science correspondent, James Wilkinson, consultant, Jeffrey Pardo. James. Just a word about their preparation. They opened the hatch bay, they entered the airlock and underwent a period of breathing pure oxygen. This was so that when they get into space, there won't be any nitrogen in their bloodstream. The reduced pressure outside might otherwise have forced that nitrogen out of the blood, forming bubbles, which would have given them the bends. That's the disease which divers get. Well, Jeffrey. They, what, their state of morale can't be terribly good after what's gone wrong up to now. How do you think this will affect their performance? Well, I don't think it will. I think, firstly, of course, a tremendous disappointment with the loss of the two communication satellites, but it wasn't connected at all with the performance of Challenger itself or, indeed, the test they're doing now. Matter of fact, I think the thing which perhaps is in their minds is that the balloon which was released and which uh, exploded and they weren't able to use it for rendezvous between the shuttle itself and the balloon. Now the balloon is six and a half feet across. Well we just uh, now have pictures Jeffrey. Um, the first pictures from space of a man floating around in the payload bay without a tether. Um, that's Bruce McCandless there with the um, jet pack on his back and at the moment he's just maneuvering around the payload bay making sure that uh, the backpack works all right and when he's done that he will then be going to um, out into the um, so the spacewalk itself. Um, Jeffrey, how f important is this ability to float free of the spaceship to future space missions? It's quite fundamental. There are quite a few scheduled flights where they will go out in this MMU, they will inspect various parts of the spacecraft, they will go out, and indeed in April this year, they will go out and repair one of the spacecraft which have been out there for some time. And to do this, of course, they need this MMU. But looking to the future, there will be times they will carry this out for emergency use. It affects a rescue mission if necessary to move people between spacecraft if there's a problem. But to the further future, of course, space stations are now committed from the United States government. I hope that uh, this is going to be an international program. And indeed, for a space station to have these MMUs and the whole untethered space capability is absolutely essential to constructing the stations and to using them. James, can I, M -M uh, Jeffrey, MMU, can you just <laughs> tell us what? Manned maneuvering unit, the uh, little nitrogen gas jet pack they have the on backpack. their back. 
That's right. So really, these things are quite fundamental, and uh, it's the first time that we've actually had, had one manned spacecraft. Uh, one's seen these things in uh, space fiction films before, but now it's happening. Geoffrey, as we see from the pictures, there's a little light flashing on, on the backpack there. Now, uh, as I understand it, when that light flashes, it means that the little jet thrusters, and there are about 24 of them altogether, are actually working and keeping him stable. Is that right? That's absolutely right. Um, it's also quite useful at uh, provide the datum for people to look at as well, but yes, uh, one gets an idea of, of how this is happening. Uh, he can either adjust that manually when he wants to move, or he can put it on an autopilot, and then the attitude, his position is held rigidly by the gyros and the little gas jets uh, working automatically. They, they've got about 26 pounds of nitrogen in those two tanks on their backs, and that, I think, is due to last them, depending on how much they use, between two and four hours. So there's plenty of spare nitrogen there, isn't there? Oh, yes, there is. And, of course, uh, one question, particularly in the light of the problems they've had, is how reliable. Well, although all 24 jets work at the same time, they're really in two sets of 12, uh, and so is the electronics which controls them, so that if anything goes wrong, then they can revert to either group of 12, and that gives a, a total control to manoeuvre and get back inside. So, essentially, the uh, redundancy is there and the security is there for all foreseeable problems which yes. might arise. The um, pictures keep going, not for any um, suspicious reason, but just because that's <laughs> the way they come down. Um, as they get out of track of one satellite onto the next one, there's a little gap. Uh, and the pictures have come down coded, of course, as well, which they have to be decoded. So that's, that's the explanation for the break in pictures. Um, we're back with the pictures now. Of course, if that nitrogen does actually give out, they can, in fact, recharge the, the tanks, can't they? And, in fact, I think one of the exercises on this mission uh, is going to be a, a recharging of the nitrogen that's going to take about 10 minutes. There's a splendid close-up of, uh, of Bruce McCandless there. Can, can I ask, Geoffrey, uh, a real layman's question? I mean, we all have nightmares about being lost in space and all that sort of thing. I mean, what is the danger that something might go wrong with their backpacks and they might simply shoot off into outer space and never be able to get back again. After all, the, uh, the satellites shot off and got lost, didn't they? Well, that's true. Um, the satellite, of course, with the greatest respect to the, to the communication satellite itself, is not a man, and perhaps less attention is paid to redundant systems to make it as secure as possible. The chance is extremely low that anything is going to go wrong, particularly in view of these two alternative systems I, meant, systems I mentioned. But the fact remains is they are now undergoing a very dangerous manoeuvre because things do go wrong, however hard one tries. And if that happens, it is entirely possible that they will move off to... Uh, uh, an uncontrolled flight. So, so it is it. possible that they could disappear into space? Yes, mm -hmm. most unlikely, but certainly possible. And that is where this question then arises of the shuttle being able to go and rendezvous with them and uh, actually bring them back into the payload bay. I think we should say that um, the person in the front of the picture is McCandless with the little light flashing on his backpack and the chap in the background is Stuart, the other man, with just the life support system on his back. He hasn't actually had his turn yet at putting on the jetpack, has he? That's correct. Geoffrey, one puzzle. This is the first time it's been done. Now, the Russians have had far more experience of uh, space flight, endurance uh, flights, uh, than the Americans have. Why haven't the Russians tried this before? Well, I think the Russians have adopted uh, a somewhat different approach altogether to manned space activity. They've concentrated on Earth orbit so far. The Americans have actually been to the moon 15 years ago. They've concentrated in, in the far distant places and they're tending to come back to Earth on space stations. The Russians have moved step by step and I think they've achieved everything they need to achieve without going to the added complication of this particular activity. Plus the fact that, again, with the greatest respect to the Russian uh, advances in capability in space, they are not as good on microelectronics and computers and precise equipment as the Americans. Representing as it does, therefore, a step forward in technology and reliability, as I've just been uh, emphasizing, I think possibly the answer to your question is the Russians have felt that they shouldn't expose themselves yet and don't need to to that level of risk. But no, they will have to in due course, no question. They've only got about five hours on this uh, particular uh, spacewalk, which sounds a long time, but they've got an awful lot to pack in, haven't they? Do you think NASA is actually working them too hard? 
No, I don't think so. Um, in one of the earlier flights, without this um, man pack, this little jet pack, um, but just the EVAs, just the spacewalks, um, with a, a, a line and handling um, themselves along through handholds on the shuttle, uh, at that point the astronauts did say, now wait a minute, that's enough, and I think they were being perhaps a little overworked there. Let me just break in there, Geoffrey, and listen to the voice of NASA commentating on what's happening. 